for decades. And venoms. And you didn't even know. And venoms. And you didn't even know. <laughs> you were taking permarin, an estrogen derived from pregnant mare urine. Premarin is abbreviated from pregnant mare urine. This was one of number one drug in America after it was marketed. Why pharmaceuticals now it's been bought by Pfizer for estrogen replacement therapy, yes. postmenopausal um, and, and various other indications. It came from pregnant mare, horse urine. You don't say no, it's filthy because it's marketed. That's what we're saying. You can extract chemicals and drugs and medicine from camel urine and it's not going to be like filthy because it will be extracted pure. So you have now Premarin. Let me give you another example. Now, which is even worse. You didn't know about this. Eurofolytropin. Now, this is from NICE because you think like, you know, <laughs> let alone besides my expertise in this subject, um, I don't want to bring this like, oh, I am an expert um, on, 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 on pharmacy, medicine and so on. Forget what I am and what I do. NICE, National Institute of Healthcare and Care Excellence, National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, NICE. They have made certain documents available, programs available, like you can get the BNF that we always use, British National Formulary, which you can go and, and look into yourself. Eurofolytropin, what does it use first of all? Infertility in women with proven hypopituitarism or who have not responded to clomiphene, superovulation treatment for assisted conception, such as in vitro fertilization. So that's the indication that it's been used. Nice approved. Um, what am I mentioning? Why am I mentioning this? Prescribing and dispensing information. Eurofolytropin is purified extract of human postmenopausal urine containing follicle stimulating hormone, FSH. Let me tell you what it is again. It is a purified extract. An extraction purified of what? Human postmenopausal urine. Human urine. From postmenopausal women. So now you are taking products from human urine. In the UK. It's an injectable form, part of and solvent for solution for injection <laughs> in UK in Europe I don't want to point fingers to you people but you need to really wisen up and waken up medicines can be extracted from so many different sources right so now you have here a medicine that has been extracted from human urine from postmenopausal women from their urine urofolytropin what about permanent? Permanent. Before this, there was another substance which they use human placenta. Eventually, when they found that the horse's urine produces a lot more, equus estrogen, then they started marketing it. So, just because it's been extracted from urine doesn't mean it doesn't have a medicinal value. So, when now we have dispelled this myth that you know, how can the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prescribe camel urine if it has a medicinal substance and it works? What's the big deal, people? This is something that works and we know why it works because even the papers now talks about how these camel urine constituents have activities against cirrhosis, liver cirrhosis and hepatitis. Ascites, which is manifested with, you know, fluid accumulated. You know, you can see how abdomens get swollen and so forth. And even in Sudan, they do this as a routine treatment. 
not because the Prophet said so, but folklore medicine. And in the hospitals, some hospitals. And you can see that how after taking this, they get better. Why they get better? Because now we realized camel urine has, it has low sodium, but very high in potassium and albumin and creatinine. So it acts as a very good diuretic, just like a medicine that would have been used for this condition would be frusamide, to get rid of this fluid that's accumulated in your body. They did a comparison study with frusamide and camel urine. And it was a very interesting result. Frusamide, of course, as you expect, had more faster results. But the other one also had results. So now we know it works and we know the science behind it. So people, lift up what's veiling your eyes or lift up what's veiling your hearts. So open up your hearts, look with your hearts, people. So instead of maligning and accusing and slandering and insulting our Prophet of Islam, the, the slander, the insult actually goes back on you. Because modern medicine proves you that you should have known better that yes, there are constituents in camel milk and camel urine that can be used for different indications, even for cancer, let alone for ascites. So that's camel milk and camel urine. I'm not a proponent of camel milk and camel urine, nor, nor am I saying our prophetic literature commands, but it was an incident for a particular group of people who came and got unwell, prophet prescribed them, these medicines to them, and it worked, they got better. That's it. Second thing now, let's to move on. The fly and the medicine and the disease within the fly. Now we know from the hadith that is narrated in our literature, it's an authentic hadith. So Muslims are not going to say, oh, no, no, this is something that didn't exist. We Muslims, long before science established or is going to establish any medicinal properties or values on these issues, if our Prophet said this, we accept it. We accept it. What we are asking is this. We are asking our scientists, Muslim scientists, wherever you are, whichever institution that you're doing your research. If your specialty is microbiology, if your specialty is looking into different disease and pathogens and extraction and so on, if you can do research and publish your research in peer-reviewed journals, because that's what we are seeing lack of. I am going to share with you a research that's been done by a professor, an entomologist. But I don't think he's published it in a peer-reviewed journal. So this is my appeal to Muslim scientists all over the world. If it's in your ability, in your capacity, whether to help with science, whether to help with laboratories, all the facilities or equipment, Please conduct proper, vigorous research to the standards that we expect today and publish your research in peer-reviewed journals because now you have the means to do that. What you have to do simply, like the example I'm going to show you, so that th this can be replicated, right? So the hadith goes like this. If إذا وقع الضباب في الشراب أحدكم فليغمس كله كله كريون ثم ينزعه فإن في أحد في أحد جناحيه فإن في أحد جناحيه دا في الآخر شفاء if a fly falls on your utensils on your drink very quickly dip it Fa, with very quick yeah, yes. don't wait 
for in one of the wings it carries a disease and the other wing it carries the cure so the hadith has been debated and talked about for centuries it is debated between Muslims not because of inauthenticity or authenticity it's an authentic hadith it's narrated in Bukhari, in Tirmidhi, in Mishkat al-Masabih, Ibn Hajar also mentioned Talqis, in various collections. So let me share with you, first of all, a recent paper published in Arabica 63 in 2016, pages 89 to 117. This is brill publications, right? Tradition and medicine on the wings of a fly by Odad Zinger, Duke University Center for Jewish Studies. Arabica is a very well known journal, peer reviewed. He talks about the medicine on the wings of the fly hadith and the traditional debate that happened over the centuries on this issue, how Muslims discuss this. And he, or she, I can't remember, Odin. Odin. Yeah. <laughs> Could be she. <laughs> yeah. The author limits the study to pre-modern debates. Debates not today, but debate that happened. Okay. So, this study examines the pre-modern debate surrounding a strange Islamic prophetic tradition that commands to fully immerse a fly that has fallen into a drink. For in one of its wings, there is a poison and the other is a cure. Studying different discussions of the hadith from the 3rd to the 9th centuries reveals the variety of ways Muslim scholars negotiated the substantial tension between the competing authorities of prophetic tradition and the Greco-Islamic scientific tradition. Finally, I propose a possible explanation of the idea of a poison and cure on fly's wings in greco roman medical discussions of the Spanish fly. Because this is a peer-reviewed paper, this author references a particular study at the very end as of an example of a modern um, attempt in giving responses to this debate. So he's not, um, he's not saying that this is a research or an answer for everything, or he, uh, she, this author. This paper is beyond the numerous websites and fame forums found online. I should note a study of a professor of entomology in the Al Hazar University that sports impressive scientific looking graphs and tables. Whether it's sarcasm or otherwise, doesn't matter. But this reference is there in this particular peer reviewed journal article. See Mustafa Ibrahim Hassan Adda wa Dawa fi Janahay al Dubab found in ijaz.org right now this is this article or paper Ustad Dr. Mustafa Ibrahim Hassan do you want to read his credential Ustad al-Hasharat Tibia Mudir Markaz Abhaz of Dirasat al-Hasharat Okay. So he is, of course, a professor, yes. Mustafa Ibrahim Hassan. What this professor has done, has done some experiments with several different types of flies. Okay. And he's taken these flies, grown them in culture media, in nutrient agar amended with 1% yeast, neutron agar amended with 5% sheep blood, or meconchis agar, starch nitrate agar, or tryptose blood agar, or staphylococcus media. These are standard agars that you can actually grow, right? He has shown that from the wings of the fly, identified several bacterial species. Okay? And then he did what is called looking at 
how much they've been growing mm. in the quantities. So peep, these are the flies that he used, P. papatasi, M. stabulans, M. domestica, and C. pipiens, right? And looked at antagonistic action of bacterial species between each other, grown on the nutrient broth, mm. amended with yeast extract. Mm. Remember, the hadith says, you dip it. Why you dip it? Because you need this particular bacterium that are now being carried by this fly so that when you immerse it in a liquid media, it will burst open and then the active chemicals or substance that is there will be released. And you will have the chemical or substance from both the wings. So he identified the substances or the, 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 the bacteria from each wings and then growth against each other. See how they have effects, whether they antagonize each other or not. And looked at whether there is a zone of inhibition. Because if you put one and then add another one, of course you can see how one interacts with another one. Whether one totally inhibits the growth of another. Because if you inhibit the growth of another bacteria, and that bacteria is a disease-carrying pathogen, then you stop the disease from forming. Yes. Yeah? Or you have no inhibition, or you have no effect. So no inhibition zone, weak inhibition zone, moderate inhibition, and good inhibition. And he found that there are several organisms, Staph aureus, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Bacillus circulans, L. animalis, Bacillus subtilis, or subtilis, and how they have this inhibitory antagonistic effect from each other. And specifically, this B. circulans, the organism, the isolated ATAT, and he tested the minimum inhibitory concentration of this active metabolite ATAT against different species of Bacillus. Subtilis, Bacillus pumilis, Macrococcus luteus, Staphylococcus aureus, Escherichia coli or E. coli, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Klebsiella pneumonia, Candida albicans, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, Aspergillus niger, Bacillus subtilis, Bacillus myocoides, Staph aureus, Salmonella and species, right? Various others. And shown the minimum inhibitory concentrations. So what's interesting is now, this professor is able to demonstrate that how species from a different wing has inhibitory effect on the other pathogen. So if you consider one of those are disease causing, the other ones is going to antagonize the effect. It works like an antidote. Subhanallah. So this is, should be the beginning of research, people. Showing you how and to go about your research. You need to know what do different kind of flies that he has collected several flies from the areas in the Arabian Peninsula. Extract the pathogens or organisms that are growing from different wings and lay against each other and see how one affects the other. If you have an antagonistic property, then clearly you can see that one you immerse and one of them, not only antagonistic properties, one of them is able to antagonize the effects of every others and becomes the dominant one to antagonize the effect so you won't have the disease effect pathogenic effects produced or caused by these bacteria um, which is being carried by this fly yeah so what we are now asking Muslims and non-Muslims now you know if you want to really disprove Islam the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam he has an opportunity non-Muslims do the research don't assume there is no science. Oh, how can it be? Do your own research and then replicate this research in peer-reviewed journals, of course, and demonstrate whether this is pure folklore or is actually there's a science behind it. You have a professor in entomology. You have a professor who's already given some examples. What we are asking Muslims now to come up with studies to be published in peer-reviewed journals. So if you're listening to this, if you're watching this, Brothers and sisters, our scientists, 
The sooner you bring this over, the less hassle that we lay people have to do to bring the prophetic sunnah to the people so that people do not have like a disgust and saying like, raise their eyebrows, how can it be? Even today's science can demonstrate the true truthfulness of the statement of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The truthfulness of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because where did he get this knowledge from? Yes. Even today you're despising, like how can it be? And yet now we are coming to the understanding that actually it's possible that the wings, when they carry these pathogens, the organisms, they may cancel each other out in terms of, in terms of their disease causing action. Because once they're immersed, then both of them are acting. So this is an example of research that needs to take on forward by scientists. And then you'll be able to demonstrate the ijaz from the Quran and the Sunnah. So I think this is enough to let people think and reflect that actually, no, it is not what you seem and think that there you go. This is totally outdated, you know, unscientific. No, the science is there and the science is highlighted. We are going to now see in the months or years to come more and more research to demonstrate that our Prophet of Islam وَمَا يَنْطِقُوا أَنِ الْهَوَى إِنْ هُوَا إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَى That he, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, does not speak of his own desires. إِنْ هُوَا إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَى It is only nothing but revelation given to him. So I thank you for being with me for this clarification and for this encouragement to our scientists out there, Muslims and non-Muslims, to look into these subjects and find out why the Prophet ﷺ would go against common sense and prescribe something like this. And if you find that this is indeed a scientifically verifiable thing, then research more about the Prophet of Islam. Research more on the Quran that he brought, who claimed to be a revelation from Allah. The first revelation being, the very first thing the Quran came. Iqra. Doesn't mean believe, but means read, recite, proclaim. So as you can see, the very first thing with the revelation that came to Prophet ﷺ is all about knowledge. Didn't our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say, my beloved brother? Learning, acquiring knowledge is mandatory, obligatory on every single Muslim, male and female. Yes. No wonder Muslims in the early days, they excel so much so that even Europe, when it was in dark ages, they had to go to our Muslim countries to go and learn about knowledge, technology, agriculture, science, how to be civilized, how to take a bath, for example. For example. Yes. Seriously. So we want to bring Islam and its history yes. and its teaching to the people so that people can appreciate that Islam is something that was for you, but you have been hindered from it, that you have been made in front of your obstacles by the critics of Islam so that you don't appreciate the truth of Islam. So people criticize Islam as, as much as you want. But what you will see that Islam will come clean of all its criticism as I have been demonstrating to you. It will prove itself that it is the truth because Islam doesn't need defending. Islam doesn't need defending people. Islam is manifest truth. It's only a matter of time. As Allah says in the Quran, it's only a matter of time. So thank you again, my dear brother. Thank you okay? okay. May Allah increase us in our knowledge. May Allah increase us in our deen. 
in our knowledge of the deen and increase us in the love of our deen and the love of our Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Like I, I've seen you saying, if my Prophet said it, I will do it. Subhanallah. May Allah make us sincere. May Allah make us more and more humble. May Allah make us patient. May Allah make us of those who can convey the message of Islam in a way that people understand, in a way that people benefit. And may Allah benefit us in this life and in the hereafter. And may Allah make us Muslims that we submit to Allah for His sake and for none other. So Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. Thank you all for listening, brother and sisters. Thank you.